That was six-year-old John Bona III blowing the shofar. The shofar is a horn traditionally that of a ram used for Jewish religious purposes. This is the Story of Liberty with John Bona, your host, live from Israel. It's our special radio broadcast from the Holy Land. I will be traveling with Matt Staver, the founder and president of Liberty Council through Israel. You know, two millennia have passed since Christ was born in Bethlehem, the event that marks the start of the Christian era. For over 2,000 years, people from all over the world have come to Israel to visit the sacred places where Christ preached his gospel. They traveled to the city of Jerusalem where uh, we will uh, start our pilgrimage uh, to discover the Holy Land a little better and uh, read the scriptures right from the sac sacred sites that are connected with them. You know, if you've had the, uh, the privilege of visiting Israel, uh, I hope this radio program tonight can help you relive, relive uh, those wonderful days. It's also our prayer that for those unable to visit Israel, uh, the land where Christ the Lord actually chose to live his life and his ministry, uh, can get you to know better through this, uh, his, his life through this special program. So our prayer is that this program will bring joy and and better understanding to many. We will start uh, with our visit in Jerusalem at several uh, sacred sites, including the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, it's called, uh, the Mount of Olives, the Garden Tomb, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the Mount of Beatitudes, uh, traveling to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea at Caesarea, and then the Sea of Galilee and Tiberias, and Capernaum, where Christ did much of his work. It's been called his headquarters. So join us uh, as we walk down the through the Via Della Rosa into the beautiful city, the old city of Jerusalem. Well, we just walked through the Muslim quarter uh, out of the uh, Damascus Gate. Over here, we just entered the, um, uh, the Wailing Wall, which is called the Western Wall here which is the closest uh, wall to the um, Holy of Holies that was originally built by Solomon and then later rebuilt by Herod the Great, the uh, temple, the Jewish temple. And here, uh, as I stand here, right next to the, uh, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, uh, it's just uh, kind of surreal. There's several people leaning up against the wall rolling up pieces of paper, putting them in the wall, and um, uh, making prayers. And, and uh, uh, it's divided, interestingly enough, about uh, two-thirds of, of the wall, or I'd say even more, probably three-quarters of the wall is uh, used by men as you walk in. Uh, on the other side is uh, for women, and they're separated. So no men are allowed on the woman's side, no women allowed on the men's side. Uh, as you walk in to the uh, western wall here, you're, you're offered a yarmulke uh, to put on your head. And um, you, uh, of course, move forward with the appropriate head covering. And uh, as you walk in, you see this here. It says, you know, refrain from unnecessary conversation during prayers and near worshipers. I'm actually up on a platform overlooking the, the uh, wall so we don't interrupt anybody. Uh, you're not allowed down there with any cell phones or anything like that. And uh, it's just an incredible place to be. This is the only fragment. I'm standing a few feet away from the the wall here. It's the only fragment of the great temple uh, to survive the Roman destruction. And the, I can tell you the divine presence of God is here. He has never departed uh, his spirit from the western wall, I believe, in the hearts of, of people who come here. As a Christian, this is uh, very meaningful to me. And, and um, 
it's, I know we all know it's one of the most sacred structures of the Jewish people for sure. Uh, it's ancient stones here. I'm, lo- I'm looking at these stones. They're huge. Um, that um, uh, stand as a testimony uh, to the, the, the glorious uh, Hebrew uh, Republic and their past. And um, it's a focus on the, uh, what I, how I see this is uh, of a Jewish longing and, and prayer. I hear their prayers right now as I, I speak to you. Uh, their prayers for Israel, for redemption, for renewal. You know, long before this, uh, on this very ground, where I stand today in the old city of Jerusalem, uh, long before the temple stood on this mount, Abraham uh, came here to sacrifice uh, his only son Isaac. And uh, Jacob also slept here and uh, dreaming of a ladder uh, to heaven. You may have read that in the Bible. Uh, Then uh, called that Mount Moriah. Its summit was where Solomon built the temple on the land which was his father, King David, and that was purchased uh, from the Jesu- Jesuits about 3,000 years ago. And that temple, of course, was destroyed by the Babylonian conquest of Nebuchadnezzar uh, in 586 before Christ and was rebuilt 70 years later. And I'm standing here looking at the remains of this. It's just incredible. It's, it was restored to its original... Um, Glory by Herod the Great about 2,000 years ago during the time of Christ. Uh, and such was its splendor. You could sense this. I'm looking at this wall. I, I can't even guesstimate how high this is. Uh, several stories high. And the splendor of it. Um, but uh, after that time in, in 68 AD, um, about 65 years, I guess, after the birth of Christ, thereabouts, the temple was destroyed by the Romans, uh, burned to the ground, and the stones were scattered with uh, only this wall here uh, untouched and remaining as, as we stand here and look at this. Now, what does this mean? What does this temple mean to Jews and non-Jews, to Christians? Uh, the prophet Isaiah called the temple a house for all nations. And um, it's uh, there's, there's a lot of emotions going through me right now, a lot of thoughts uh, for a Jew and a non-Jew. Of course, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I'll tell you, I feel energized. And uh, even with the temple destroyed, uh, the remains of this sacred wall uh, for the Jews, uh, and for every generation, really, in prayer. Um, and I, as I look around here, there's people here from all over the world. Uh, converging here to pray uh, for Israel and their future, and uh, these requests and please be uh, please uh, being made through these these timeless stones, these big, huge boulders that set this foundation. It's uh, a place of dig- dignity, and when you approach this, and I I could see the uh, sincerity of the people here as they pray. Um, Just to give you a little bit about the dimensions of this wall, it's over 180 feet uh, in height, actually. It's 1,600 feet long, and it stretches. I mean, I'm looking at this wall. It's just huge, and there are these tunnels that lead in and out of this area. It's amazing. But, uh, you know, really, what is, as I stand here and, I, I'm a li- just walking a little bit away here so they don't hear me as they pray. Um, you know, you ask yourself, what what is the so special about being at the Western Wall? And uh, I think, in a sense, all stand equal here uh, for me as a Christian at the foot of the cross, and for Jews, they're uh, they're in front of the wall here. Their their sense of Judaism, uh, often some for the first time, they're not. A lot of the Jews here have, have, are here for the first time. And they're touching these stones and trying to link with their nation and their heritage. And, of course, their turbulent history that we know about. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, as you, you stand here, you, your feelings kind of crystallize. And, and the things of life just seem to fade away. 
uh, I can't exactly explain it. It's it makes you think the other things of life that sometimes that we care about are so insignificant. Uh, this wall has withstood time, and it has wis- witnessed war and peace. And, and here comes many young uh, Orthodox Jews with their black hats and their hair, uh, black suits, white shirts, walking out of the one of the tunnels. And uh, it's, it uh, is the most visited site in Israel, the Western Wall. And I think to feel and really understand this experience, if you ever come to Jerusalem, you have to come here to the Western Wall. Uh, it, it just, it, it is, you, you get a real, real sense of history. And... Um, uh, to be here, and I could tell you, I, I participated in the prayers last night, and the night before, and um, with our Jewish friends. And of course, my prayer is that my Jewish friends will come to know the Redeemer, the Savior of the world, uh, Christ alone. Okay, we're going to make our way over to the Mount of Beatitudes. Uh, Matt, as you were reading that, I, I we're here at the uh, the great uh, place where Christ gave his sermon on the mount. And as you read the whole sermon there in the book of Matthew, chapter five, six, and seven, I couldn't help to think as you were reading that in that time when Christ walked up here and delivered this most astonishing sermon that's ever been given that will never be uh, equaled. It'll never be sur- surpassed. It's um, uh, the meaning is so uh, deep-rooted. And, and Matt, I appreciate uh, uh, you inviting us on this tour here in Israel. It's been great. As we're standing here, uh, to you personally, the significance of that sermon, uh, what does it mean to you? It's amazing to actually be here um, on the edge of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus would have given that sermon. And when you read the sermon and he talks about you've heard that it was said long ago, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, hate your, your enemies. And yet he then turns it around and, and goes to a much deeper meaning. It's a very radical change in people's thinking. And when you think about the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus here began his ministry in the Galilee. And those words not only astonish the people, but they've literally echoed through history. And you see all of the people here that are gathered, yes. that are here from around the world. You see people that are speaking in Spanish. You see people from different parts of the world, from the United States, that are all gathered here because of what happened on the shores of this Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, the slopes. It's interesting, too, how our tour guide told us how Christ, uh, we're right near Capernaum where his, uh, Christ did a lot of his work from. It's been called his headquarters. And how he would be able to go to and from here across the, the lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, uh, to different places like Tiberias uh, without interference. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could just uh, you could yeah, you can see, see that. Yeah, you just get on your boat and go across <laughs> the, to the shore without having to go across the border crossing. But he could go back and forth pretty easily. Well, thank you, Matt Staver. Appreciate your time, and uh, this is a great trip. Well, you know, it was amazing to be on the boat uh, last night on the Sea of Galilee and uh, to read from the Gospel of Matthew 14 where Jesus walked on the water and Peter got out of the boat, began to sink, and then Jesus reached down and grabbed his hand as he was focused on the waves as opposed to Jesus and thus began to sink and then Jesus grabbed him and said, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Uh, I mean, it's right here where the 5,000 were fed. It's here where the Sermon on the Mount took place. It's here where Jesus walked on the water, and it's across the lake here of the Sea of Galilee where he cast out the demons, and they went into the pigs and rushed over the mountain. And it's here where he used the Sermon on the Mount, the city on a hill can't be hid. And at night, last night, we could see the city lights on the tops of the hills. Uh, So you're right here in the very 
area where it all happened. Much of his ministry really is right here, right? right? Here, yeah. This is Only that. the last part of his ministry was in Jerusalem. All of it was right here in the northern part, or right around the Galilee. And you just, like you said earlier, you think of this 2,000 years later. Look look at the people from all the nations still coming here to, mm. uh, to in, a, in a sense, to honor Christ and, and worship him. We hear music in the background, people singing different languages and songs mm. uh, of worship to him this day. And uh, it's amazing how... 2,000 years ago when he walked up here and uh, gave that sermon, how that still echoes throughout history, through the channels of time. It'll never end. Yeah, yeah, it'll never end. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, what, what we see there, Jesus may have obviously elaborated more on the Sermon on the Mount than, than what we said, what we've read, but those are the, that's the, those are the words that he read, uh, that he spoke. And just... Uh, you know, when you think about the people after listening to them, they're thinking of, they're going to the normal synagogues. They're seeing the people who are very ritualistic, going through their prayers, very high on a pedestal that the mm. common person couldn't reach to. And then Jesus came in with these teachings. And no wonder why they were shocked. It was almost like their breath Radical, was Radical, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To love your enemy. To love your enemy. Uh, and that God uh, wants to get, you know, God is your father and pray to him. Uh, and, and pray in secret. Don't don't worry about trying to just please or uh, show other people about your piety. Uh, but God will see you in secret, and He'll reward you openly. That's a the Sermon on the Mount. That's a, a tough uh, road for anybody, for especially for the Christian to, to have your life live that way. Yeah. And that's that should be a goal every day, shouldn't it? To to live our lives that way. What Christ taught that very day. Yeah. Yeah. It sure and, is. Uh, well, that's great. It's a great, great reminder here on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. Isn't it? Oh, it's it's unbelievable. Okay, now we're making our way over to Caesarea, uh, right on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we're back here with Matt Staver, uh, Liberty Council. We've made our way over from the. Uh, the uh, Mount of Beatitudes yesterday, and over here to the. Uh, uh, Caesarea, which we're standing a few hundred yards here from the uh, beautiful Mediterranean Sea and uh, in this old uh, amphitheater uh, that Herod the Great uh, built originally. And uh, it's an incredible place here. There's so much history here, isn't there? There's an incredible amount of history in this place. This is the place where we had the uh, vision of the unclean animals, and Peter was told to rise up and eat and he said he wouldn't because those were unclean he never ate anything that was unclean and that was where God was revealing to Peter that he was getting ready to take the gospel the good news of Christ forgiveness of sins in Jesus the Messiah to the Gentiles and they could be part of God's people grafted into the vine of uh, his people and it's also from this place in Caesarea Maritima, this seaport that was built by Herod the Great, that the Apostle Paul was imprisoned for a couple of years. So he had literally walked around the same places that we've been able to walk around, and some of this is actual original uh, flooring from the time of the Apostle Paul. And it is from here in the book of Acts where he is presented before Felix. And it's there where he appealed to Caesar. And Felix says, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. And it is from the shores of Caesarea that he's placed on a boat and taken across the Mediterranean to Rome. And, of course, the gospel now is carried to Rome and then around Europe. And then, obviously, it comes to the shores of America. And thus, the history and the linkage between America and Israel and the Jewish people. Well, I know, Matt, this, is, this trip has really strengthened my faith, and uh, it's just a tremendous experience for, to come to Israel and see this firsthand. You know, you read the Bible, and you get a picture in your mind of what things are like. When you come here, it's different, isn't it? It is. So you can tell people about this place, but you really have to experience it. It really is life-changing, and you literally walk where Jesus walked. You walk where the apostles walked. You see where our faith began. You see these real places that are 2,000 years old that go back to the time of Christ. Uh, you're in the, the Galilee, which we were there just uh, 
a few days ago, for a few days, uh, where Jesus' uh, primary ministry was. And so it all really began here. But the experience of being here with other believers, uh, singing Christian songs, uh, reading from the actual scriptures on the sites where these things happen, uh, being baptized in the Jordan River, uh, it's just uh, an experience that you cannot convey in words. You literally have to be here, but it is a life-changing experience. Oh, absolutely. I know my wife uh, was one of the the many people that you baptized uh, yesterday, and she uh, uh, she woke up this morning and said it was one of the best days of her life that uh, to get rebaptized actually, and it's it's been a dream of hers actually to, uh, and one of the main reasons she came here to get baptized in the in the Jordan. So we thank you for that and inviting us on the trip, and uh, really appreciate. Uh, working with Liberty Council, a uh, great organization. We appreciate you, Matt Staver, and all the good work you do. Uh, keep fighting the good fight, and uh, uh, again, thank you for inviting us, Matt. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. You know, uh, God's called us to be ambassadors, and obviously we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, but we also need to be ambassadors for Israel and his people. And uh, there's nothing like coming here to really equip you and inspire you to be a greater ambassador, and uh, that's what our hope is for this trip. Man, also, just one more minute here. We're looking at the, the old ruins here. Right on, We're right on the Mediterranean, literally 30 yards away here. Uh, these old ruins here that look like somewhat like an old stadium uh, seating right on the shore, uh, th these are 2,000 years old, right? Yeah, there's a hippodrome here where they did the chariot races and horse races. Uh, there was... People who questioned whether Pontius Pilate was real, he's mentioned in the New Testament, but there was no archaeological find to prove that he actually existed. Well, we're walking right now to the first discovered uh, inscription of Pontius Pilate right here in Caesarea Maritima, and his name is inscribed on that stone just about 20 yards in front of us. Oh, fantastic. Thank you again, Matt Staver at Liberty Council, and uh, God bless. From heaven. In answer rang. I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Well, we hope we, you have uh, enjoyed the first uh, half uh, of our live show from Israel, our special uh, radio broadcast. Uh, right from the Holy Land. And uh, in the uh, second half, I'll be traveling uh, over to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane and also the Garden Tomb. And uh, we'll be visiting these sites, and we hope that you could stay with us and join us, uh, especially the interviews that I, I think you're going to find very interesting uh, in the Garden Tomb with the gentleman there from England who... Uh, is uh, very influential in keeping the, uh, the tomb in good shape and handling all the tours. Uh, we're going to hear firsthand from an English uh, gentleman who uh, changed his, his life. Uh, he came uh, here to Jerusalem like I did, and, and uh, one visit to the, uh, the garden tomb uh, changed his life forever. He, uh, you'll hear the story firsthand how he left his, his country, his job, and moved to Jerusalem to handle the tours every day. And it's the ministry that he's chosen for his life. Uh, he wakes up every morning and, and, do, and does all these uh, tours uh, for free. And uh, I don't know how he survives there. He must work at night, but stay tuned. This is an amazing story of, of a man who changed his life on one trip to Jerusalem. Join us in a few seconds with the Story of Liberty, live from Israel. 